right. I'm going to do the description here. I feel like I should turn on a light. Yeah, I always have my little halo going. Yeah, let's just start doing that. I'm not at home today, so I'm a little discombobulated. That always happens, I find. I'm going to all be discombobulated next week when it's I'm at my sister's house and I'm mm. in their house. They don't have very good um, internet all the time. So I might be using hotspot from my phone. Story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I've got in Happy Sharing So Fair Solutions Group. I'm going to click go live. All right. We're live now, too. Wonderful. I am just going to wait a moment until I get that echo. <laughs> And then X out. <laughs> All right, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> there. I hear the echo. Yep, I got out of there. So we can get going. All right, good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to Top Question Tuesday today. Today we have a wonderful topic. We're going to talk about food sensitivities and how they relate to rheumatoid arthritis and all other autoimmune conditions. So uh, first off, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jessica Melnick. I am a registered holistic nutritionist and the founder of the Anti-Arthritis Method and your host of the Happy Joints Arthritis Solutions Group. And as usual, I have my colleague Casey Kephart with me today. So Casey, I'll let you introduce yourself and uh, say a little bit about what you do. Yep. So I am Casey Kephart. I live in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, I am the founder of Nutrition with Casey. My program is for women with autoimmune diseases, not just rheumatoid like Jessica does. It is called the Autoimmune Disease Formula. Um, and you can check out my free Facebook group at Nutrition for Women with Autoimmune Disease. Um, and Jessica and I run basically the same businesses, but she has a little closer knit niche to autoimmune diseases than I do. Um, and we're here to talk about everything autoimmune disease. Yeah. So uh, this week you get to see us twice. We'll be back on Thursday and we have plans for getting together a couple times a week, but we will keep you posted in our groups, our respective groups. So you'll know when you can expect us live. You can also always watch the replay and we do see your comments. So if you have any questions about what we talked about today, then just comment on the replay or comment live and we will be happy to answer those for you. Or if you have um, topic suggestions, let us know because we're always happy to do them. I feel like we can talk 10 years about autoimmune disease, but if there's something you want to hear before the 10 years is up, let us know and we'll be happy to do a topic on it. Absolutely. <laughs> Good point, Casey. So like I said, today we're going to talk about food sensitivities and um, how they relate to autoimmunity in general. So the first part of this topic we're going to talk about is what exactly are food sensitivities and how are they different from a food allergy? Why do we have them and how does this relate to autoimmune conditions? So Casey, why don't you start off and just share with us what a food sensitivity is? Yeah, so don't get it confused with a food allergy. Food allergy and food sensitivities are, are alike, but also very different. Um, so a food sensitivity is a negative reaction to a food inside of you. It's chronic inflammation. So usually when our bodies are overworked, overstressed, sleep deprived, um, inflamed, and we have a leaky gut, food sensitivities start to come up. So food sensitivities could be anything like the major allergens, which would be wheat, corn, soy, um, dairy, or it could be spinach, it could be quinoa, it could be, um, you know, beef, it could be really anything. So I don't know if you guys caught the live, I think it was two years, two years ago, two weeks ago that I explained this where 
it's, it's like a night shift worker, let's say a nurse that's overworked, um, sleep deprived, all of that. And they start making mistakes, right? Our body does the same thing. So when our body is overworked and sleep deprived, we start tagging proteins and let's say a quinoa mo molecule or a quinoa protein, I mean, and um, that tells the body that we need to fight this protein every time it comes into our body. So that's why we get the the food sensitivity that we call it. And you get all of these nasty symptoms that we'll talk about in a little bit. So basically it's inflammation towards any foods that your body tags as harmful. Yes, absolutely. And like you said, there's a difference between a food sensitivity and a food allergy. So a food allergy results in like a severe immediate reaction. So we're thinking about anaphylaxis, you know, having, um, you know, swelling of your tongue, having an immediate like hives or, or rash reaction. So it's, it's more severe than, um, than a food sensitivity and it's more immediate. So a food sensitivity often you're not going to notice anything for about approximately four hours to up to 72 hours later after you've consumed a food that you are sensitive to. So a much more delayed response where an allergy is an immediate response. So another big thing is why is it important to address these food sensitivities? So if we can keep consuming foods that we're sensitive to, we are adding fuel to the fire per se, and we're increasing inflammation in our body and a continually overreactive immune system, which results in more autoimmune symptoms. So Casey, you started talking a little bit about this a moment ago. So did you want to elaborate on that a little bit? The, the symptoms or the, what happens if we keep consuming foods that we're sensitive to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're not going to heal first and foremost. So if you keep putting in foods that are causing inflammation in your body, adding the fire or adding the gasoline to the fire, you're going to keep feeling horrible. You're not going to get better. So you're not going to sleep right. You're going to have these skin issues, everything that we'll talk about in a little bit. But um, so you want to get that inflammation down as as much as you can. So then your body can have time to recover and recoup and rest and digest and all of that stuff. So you can actually work on healing. Um, and a little side note is, you know, there's a lot of people, and I'm sure Jessica, you get this too, with autoimmune disease. Um, there's a lot of people that want to work on losing weight with autoimmune disease because our body is so inflamed and we, we, um, gain weight. If you have a lot of food sensitivities and you have a lot of inflammation in your body, you're not going to lose weight at all. Um, so that would be, I know weight loss is often a big motivator to, um, to doing the right thing. So if you want to lose weight, figure out your food sensitivities, figure out what's hurting your stomach and making you bloated and all of that. Um, and once that inflammation goes down, then that weight will start to fall off naturally as well. Yeah. Um, does that answer the question? I kind of went on a tangent there. No, that's a really great point. I think uh, another piece of that puzzle too, is that whole, the whole concept of leaky gut. And because I often get asked, well, where the heck do these food sensitivity sensitivities come from? Why do I have this in the first place? And so like you were saying before, you know, um, chronic stress over time. And so not just like necessarily stress in our lives, um, you know, things like work or family, um, but stress to our body. So, you know, the onslaught of things like chemicals in the environment, um, chemicals yeah. in our food, chemicals and our uh, personal care products, not to mention, you know, chemicals and like things in processed foods, if we're eating a lot of that, those, um, you know, high sugar diet with a whole, lots of refined carbohydrates. So all these things contribute to like an overall chronic stress on our body and our system and our gut. And so when we have this chronic inflammation and stress over time, our gut lining becomes permeable and leaky. So hence what we call leaky gut or intestinal permeability. And so what happens is we have undigested food particles like undigested food proteins that haven't been broken down further enough to be absorbed 
um, those are leaking through the uh, the holes in our in our inflamed gut, and and not to mention you know bacteria and other toxins that are leaking out of our gut into our body, and this is creating our overreactive uh, immune system, and so that's the precursor to confusing our immune system and tagging those foods like you were saying earlier, Casey. So our body is recognizing these. Uh, undigested food particles and other toxins as foreign invaders and it gets confused so sometimes you know like you said it could be something as benign as spinach that you might be sensitive to when a lot of people aren't because over time your body gets it's so overreactive and gets so confused that it might see that as a negative thing and it's trying to protect you from yeah. um, from more inflammation and that's what our immune system is doing so did you have anything you wanted to add to that at all Casey I'm you're really <laughs> good at analogies and I kind of uh, t talk about it in a roundabout way no I really liked how you put that too and everything was really well said um, on the topic of analogies. So for leaky gut, I kind of think of it as um, a dotted line in the road, right? So we're supposed to have two yellow lines in the road. We don't cross that, right? Um, when your gut is leaky though, it's kind of like a dashed white line in the road or a dashed yellow line in the road. And now things can go in and out of it. That's bad. We don't want that. And so that's when those food sensitivities really start because there's undigested food particles that our bodies are just attacking. And um, it's like an army going on every single day. So um, one thing that I don't think we did mention, and it's a little sciencey, but was the difference, like how do you know the difference between a food allergy and a food sensitivity more than just like the reaction time was you have antibodies in your body. And if you get a test for this, your food allergy, like when you, when you know you have a food allergy, it's going to increase in your IgA. Um, I'm sorry, IgE. And then when you have a food sensitivity, it increases your antibodies of IgG and IgA. Yeah. Did I say that right? Yes, I did. Yeah, you did. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so just something to look out for. If you already have tests at home, you can look back at those. Um, but that, that would be the main difference. And also just knowing that a food sensitivity can go away. It is temporary, but you have to put in the work just like you have to put in the work with an autoimmune disease, um, protocol as well. So don't think that this is a forever thing at all. Yeah. Like you said, you have to allow your body and your gut to heal in order rest. for your body to be, yes, and rest in order for your body to become more tolerant over time of certain foods. So you aren't necessarily going to always be sensitive to something that you're sensitive to now if your body has had that time and that process to, to heal and to become yeah. more tolerant. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that spinach is a bad food. If you're sensitive to it, it doesn't mean that quinoa is a bad food. If you're sensitive to it, it just so happened that was the molecule or the, I keep saying molecule. That's the protein that your body decided that it wanted to attack because it made a mistake. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So let's talk a little bit about how food sensitivities manifest in our bodies. So some of the symptoms that we might have uh, for, for food sensitivities. So Things like having uh, more flare-ups with joint pain. So if you have rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, inflammatory arthritis, um, any autoimmune condition, you're going to have maybe a flare-up in uh, fatigue and any other of your autoimmune symptoms. Things like itchy eyes or a runny nose, skin irritations such as rashes, hives, eczema, psoriasis digestive disturbances like bowel irregularity and stomach upset, mood changes, fatigue, brain fog, headaches. So all sorts of things that can be a, cause, like a result of food sensitivities. So anything that you wanted to add to that, Casey? Yeah. A quick list. Yeah. So those are the really common ones. Of course, any symptom around the sun, you, your body can, um, your body can have when having a food sensitivity. It just depends on who you are, your genes, things like that. But um, each time you have a 
a, a food sensitivity, let's say flare, or you eat something that you know you're sensitive to, you're gonna probably have the same symptoms each time. So for me, it's like my stomach starts like turning and it's not, it's not right, or gas and bloating, and then my mood really fails. I have a subpar mood when I eat something that my body does not like. So for you, it might be you start to like itch on your foot or your arm, and um, your ears start itching or um, brain fog. So keep these symptoms in mind and try to think back um, to what you ate and how you're feeling each time. And we'll get to, you know, how to diagnose and test this in a, in a little bit. But I think we covered most of the symptoms there. And these symptoms can be just the same as having an autoimmune disease too. So they're kind of hard to um, look out for, but just know that if you are experiencing any negative reaction to any food, it's trust your gut on that. It's probably that your, your body doesn't like it right now and you need to take a break from it. Mm -hmm, exactly. So the way we figure out what foods we're sensitive to and uh, why it's important to find out is because A, if we don't, if we continue to eat something we're sensitive to, like we said before, our body's not going to be able to heal. And it's, we're going to continue having that overactive immune system and the autoimmune uh, condition symptoms as well. So one of the ways that we can actually figure out what foods that we are sensitive to is doing a food log. So a food log is basically keeping a diary of what you're eating and taking notes about how you feel after uh, eating those certain foods. So the thing though with this, the downside is that it's not necessarily the most effective way to determine what you're sensitive to because you can't really pinpoint a specific food that you're sensitive to if you haven't already uh, eliminated them and then reintroduced uh, foods gradually. So for example, let's say you're having um, an omelet for breakfast with some toast and some fruit. That's a lot of different food components there. So, and you, let's say you feel kind of rotten after that. Let's say you're tired or you get a headache um, and a stomach ache. Okay, well, we don't really know which of those foods that you're sensitive to. Is it the eggs? Is it, you know, the vegetable, one of the vegetables that you put in the omelet? Is it uh, the nitrates from the bacon maybe you put inside the omelet? Is it the bread? Is it the butter? Is the it- The pepper you know? that you put on your eggs? Yeah, it's like, how do, you, how do you know which one of those foods because you haven't pinpointed it. So that's the downside of the food blog. It can give you some insight into, um, you know, after eating something, you might be able to narrow it down as you go along if you're kind of have a systematic way about doing it. Um, but it is, it is fairly complicated. And so this is why both Casey and myself address this in our program. This is one of the main things we do in the program is helping our clients do an elimination phase and a reintroduction phase so that they can pinpoint exactly what is bothering them at this point so that their bodies are able to heal and we're able to eventually have a wider range of a diet over time once our gut has had time to heal and our symptoms have calmed down because that's the only way that we're going to get our symptoms to calm down. So yeah. Casey, why don't, anything else you want to say about that before I know yeah. to talk about some food sensitivity testing as well? Yeah, definitely. So um, like, like Jessica said, a food log is, it can work, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot of pinpointing and you kind of need to be really skilled at it. Um, but one thing touching on the program part of it in, is we start with the elimination diet. We let our bodies rest and digest and heal. And then we, um, we add in the foods that may be, um, okay with you and okay to digest and settle right with you. The ones that aren't, we keep it off for a little longer and then we retry it again. It's the same thing, um, with food sensitivity protocol as well. But what I was getting at there was, um, at the end of the program, you're really going to know your body best. And that's what you need to do with an autoimmune disease. You need to learn your body inside and out. And you may think you do right now, but I guarantee you, if you're having gas bloating, bowel irregularity, things like that, you don't know your body that well. Um, and what's doing it. So, I guess I'll just get in with the food sensitivities, um, food sensitivity test. So that's the other way of 
figuring out your food sensitivities. You can, you can log it, you can write down everything every day, your mood that goes with it, or you can take a food sensitivity test, um, either a nutritionist, um, functional medicine or actually any doctor can probably do it naturopath um I'm, I'm pretty sure chiropractors can do it too um but the food sensitivity test will test and it depends which which food sensitivity test you get will test 50 to 500 foods and it will put it in columns for you so I brought mine from a long time ago and this isn't the food sensitivity test that I give my patients but it's one of them and it kind of shows you what it will look like. Every test is different, but it'll have a green, yellow, um, some have an orange, some don't, and a red. So basically don't eat for a bit. Mild reaction, let's let's hold off for a bit. And then green is good to go, you know, pretty simple. Um, so how these work is in the green column, it'll be like these, these foods are okay with you. It doesn't cause inflammation. The yellow column is, you know, we're seeing a reaction here. We're seeing some inflammation with these foods. We want to hold off on the yellow column for about six weeks. Give your body that time to rest, digest, um, and put out the fire. For that red column, you'll want to eliminate all of those for six months. Those are the ones that are like, oh, hell no, Nancy. Like, this really hurts me. This is causing a lot of inflammation. Um, I don't like these foods at all. So you, you'll definitely want to stay away from those for six months. Um, and, and then we, we start to in, introduce them again after that time is done, little by little, one time, one piece at a time. Um, but it's effective and it gives you a starting point. And I wouldn't say it's 100% accurate each time. Um, there's so many more foods out there that we just don't know of or toxins and environmental things, but this is definitely a faster and easier way to feel better in a shorter amount of time too. Mm -hmm. um, I know I did one of these, I think it was two years ago and I followed it to a T because just like with gluten and eating gluten, you can't just eat a little bit of pizza and you know feel okay. You, you have to be really strict with this. And when you are, um, and when I did two years ago, my energy increased immensely. My sleep quality was so much better. My mood, my, my boyfriend at the time was like, wow, you need to stay off these foods because I was just, I was a happier person. Um, and my bloating went away, my skin looked better. So it's worth it. And like we had a live about it last time too, is this is another way to get over that hump of 70% feeling better to go to a hundred percent. Um, so I would really, really look back to this past week on the symptoms that you've had, um, the foods that you've eaten and really, and really think about getting a food sensitivity test or at minimum doing a food log, um, because we need to get rid of that inflammation. So more autoimmune diseases don't arise in you and you can start feeling better. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is why Casey and myself have programs to help guide our clients through this, because we, we realize this is hard to do, you know, yeah. and even for us being, you know, nutrition practitioners, we, we struggled too. And, and it would have been, I know for myself, I, I did this on my own because I didn't, I didn't have a program. I didn't have um, like a health practitioner that was guiding me through this. I was doing this myself. And so I, I know how tricky that it can be and to know like, how am I, am I doing this right? And just having somebody to lead that way for you. So you know that you're doing it correctly and you have that support for, you know, the times that you do just want to uh, order a pizza and drink a bottle of wine because we all get there sometimes. So uh, that's why we both have created the programs in such a way that we have is because we know that there is a need for guidance to help us get through that and to figure that out so that we can start feeling better and get rid of our symptoms. And like you said, like, you know, put the, put some water on the fire, you know, bring down that pain and inflammation. So yeah. And yeah. it works yeah. and we all need a little hand holding or a kick in the butt and that's okay to do. Um, nobody should go through this journey alone at all. And I know both Jessica and I did, and thankfully we figured it out, but it took years. It literally took a lot of years and a lot of money to figure it out. Um, so we kind of want to slash that in half for you. 
Um, so we're here to just give you the answers, honestly, because that makes us happy. And I know that would make you happy too. So don't be like us and just do it on your own and reinvent the wheel. We, we've done it. Yes, we figured it out. So you don't have to create a new one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I think we've covered anything, everything, unless there's anything else you wanted to add, Casey? No, I think we did too. Um, I, I like just saying this at every, at the end of every live is this is all temporary. Nothing is forever here. You're going to feel better if you put in the work and you are consistent with it and just know that what you're going through now is not what you're going to go through next year. If you stay the course and you stay the track. Yeah, that's absolutely. It. I couldn't say it better. So <laughs> <laughs> like you said, awesome. we, drop, we can just end there. Mic drop. I guess <laughs> I got it this time. You had it last week. <laughs> We're taking turns. We're taking turns. Right. <laughs> right. You'll have Thursdays, maybe. Maybe. All right. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we really have a lot of fun doing this. And like I said before, please comment. Uh, we will definitely ask, uh, answer your questions. And we'd love to get your feedback too, if there's any specific questions that you have. And we will be back on Thursday around the same time to share some more information with you. So have a lovely rest of your day and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.